do you want to get well? It seems like an easy question on the surface. Of course we want to get well. Why do you think we're spending all this time and money and effort improving our situation? All the doctor visits, pharmacy bills, counseling, rehabilitation, support groups, or buying the latest breakthrough cookbook or product to promote healthy eating and digestion? I'm not here to knock any of the things I've listed. It's just that I've lived long enough to know we can get attached to our particular area of struggle. Part of us wants to get well, and the other part has no idea what we'd focus on if we actually did become healthy. How would our life change? Could we handle a different life than what we're used to? This third sign, revealing Jesus as the Messiah, centers around this question he posed to the man at the pool of Bethesda. As we hear about their encounter, let's let Jesus' question, do you want to get well, echo in our hearts as well. I'm reading from the Living Bible, The Way. From John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Afterwards, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish religious holidays. Inside the city, near the Sheep Gate, was Bethesda Pool, with five covered platforms or porches surrounding it. Crowds of sick folks, lame, blind, or with paralyzed limbs, lay on the platforms waiting for a certain movement of the water, for an angel of the Lord came from time to time and disturbed the water, and the first person to step down into it afterwards was healed. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew how long he had been ill, he asked him, would you like to get well? I can't, the sick man said for I have no one to help me into the pool at the movement of the water. While I am trying to get there, someone else gets in ahead of me. Jesus told him, stand up, roll up your sleeping mat, and go on home. Instantly, the man was healed. He rolled up the mat and began walking. But it was on the Sabbath when this miracle was done. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. It's illegal to carry that sleeping mat. The man who healed me told me to, was his reply. Who said such a thing as that, they demanded. The man didn't know, and Jesus had disappeared into the crowd. But afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and told him, now you are well. Don't sin as you did before, or something even worse may happen to you. Then the man went to find the Jewish leaders and told them that it was Jesus who had healed him. Thank you, Lois. If you were here last week, you'll remember our story was about the royal official who traveled a long way to, to get to Jesus and ask him to come and heal his son. But in this week, Jesus is the one who takes the initiative to heal a person who doesn't even know who he is. Jesus is drawn to heal and to help us. Here he is back in Jerusalem from Galilee at the time of one of the festivals. The city is crowded. Jesus decides that he's going to head north of the temple and visit the pool of Bethesda. And John describes this place as a place being surrounded by five rows of columns with a roof over them. So it's not all that open air. It's, it's more of kind of a, you go down the steps to the pools. But it was actually uncovered by archaeologists at the end of the 19th century. And Bethesda means house of mercy. In Jesus' time and in beyond that time, the pool was thought to have a special healing ability. And so people would crowd around the pool, people who wanted to be healed, who were blind, had trouble walking, or even moving at all. No one seemed to notice Jesus or ask him to heal them. 
but Jesus noticed them. One man in particular caught his attention, and he had not been able to walk for the last 38 years. It's a long time. Jesus knew he had been in that condition for a very long time without anyone even telling him. And his heart went out to the man, and Jesus desired to show him the mercy that that pool was named after. Tony Evans says, Jesus knows right where you are, and he knows how long you've been there. He's an African-American pastor and teacher, and he has a whole series on the book of John on Right Now Media I've been enjoying listening to. But consider what he said. Think for a moment. Where have you been stuck? What situation in your life do you desire to be different? And how long have you been struggling with it? Often, the longer you wait for healing and wholeness, the less it seems possible that it could actually happen. But even if you aren't looking up to Jesus for help, Jesus has got his eye on you. This isn't to say that it is God's will that we don't have any struggles. God allowed the Apostle Paul to have what he called a thorn in his flesh, something that made him aware of his weakness, so that that would be the place where the strength of gra and grace of God would meet him, and he wouldn't become too proud. But sometimes God's purposes are best served when he does heal us, and we can tell people about that and give him glory. And other times, God's grace and help meets us in our situation, and we aren't fully healed until the day we meet him face to face in heaven. Whatever the case is, please know that we are not overlooked or forgotten by Jesus. One day, he might surprise us, just like he surprised the man at Bethesda by asking, Do you want to get well? The man in our story had his eyes on the obstacles. He offers an explanation of why he hasn't been healed. In verse 7, he says, Sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the angel stirs up the water. I try to get in, but someone always goes down ahead of me. It's as though he knows what he's doing isn't working, but he doesn't know what else to do. He just sits there waiting for someone who would be willing to wait with him until the water is troubled and the opportunity comes around again. I don't know if the angel really did stir the water. I did a lot of reading about this pool, and it seems like there's an intermittent spring that bubbles up from time to time. And it might be that God uses the spring in a special way to bring healing. God works in mysterious ways and heals people in ways that we don't understand. It kind of reminded me of a movie I watched just this weekend. It was on Netflix, and it's about a family in Africa who were waiting on a miracle, too. They were waiting for rain in the dry season. It's called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. William Kamkawamba lived in a village in Malawi that was suffering from famine. His family was starving. The small harvest they had brought in was actually stolen right out of their little cupboard where they kept it. The dad's out there with his hoe trying to make the barren fields into rows. He's putting all this energy out, but it wasn't helping. There was no rain. His son, William, had read a book in the school library about energy, and he wanted to try to build a windmill to attach to their well because he found a water pump in the dump, and he thought that he could get the wind energy to run the water pump. But he needed his dad's bicycle as part of making this new machine work, and it was like the one thing the family had left was his dad's bike and he did not want to hand it over to his son. He just didn't believe that anything was possible to get water onto those fields except for rain. 
when he finally opened his heart to believe another person was able to bring the relief so desperately needed. It was the miracle that their whole town needed. And it was the beginning of a new life for all of them. So that water came trickling out into the field. And although in our story the man's eyes were on the obstacles, Jesus could still see the desire that he had to be made well. And on this day, the opportunity arrived. Not the way he pictured it. He thought someone would care about him enough to wait with him and pick him up and put him in the water when it was troubled. But he opened his heart to receive healing in a different way. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your bed, and walk. And at that moment, the man felt a life-giving power, like the water just flowing right through him. And it was a big miracle, because if you haven't been able to walk for 38 years, and you are suddenly able to stand up and walk, there's some regeneration of muscles that have long atrophied. He felt that transformation inside of him, and he had the courage to do his part, to follow Jesus' instructions. What do you think was going through the man's mind as he stood for the first time in decades and knelt down to roll up that bedding he had spent so long on? Did he take the time to look around at the others still hanging out by the pool? Did he wave goodbye as he started walking? I kind of wonder if he was in a daze, like bewildered by this miracle that just dropped in on him. He didn't ask for it. He didn't even know who Jesus was. How would you react if Jesus suddenly healed you from that thing that's been hanging around for a long time? Do you think you might be in a daze of bewilderment too, wondering what's my life going to be like now? Are there people that you wouldn't see as often if your situation changed? What about the part that Jesus asks us to do? For the man in Bethesda, it was pretty straightforward. Get up, pick up your bed, and walk. All he had to decide to do was which direction to walk in. For us, it might take some time to discern where our life path is going to head now that we've been released from something that held us back. But it's very possible that God's healing is for something special for us to do. When God healed my chronic migraines, I realized I was going to have a lot more time to do things. I wouldn't have to spend an hour or two in bed every day trying to recover and take my medicine. And I began to picture my life serving in vocational ministry after I graduated from school. I was happy to give my life back to the God who gave me my life. What would you do if you were released from a heavy burden? Do you have a dream already of what you would do? Or maybe you need some time to think and pray about it. The newly healed man didn't have much time to think before. He faced a challenge right away. He's walking, he's carrying his mat, and a different group of people stop him and say, Hey, it's the Sabbath day. The law does not allow you to carry your mat. And all of a sudden, he's getting into trouble for something he couldn't have even done earlier that day. He simply replies, The one who made me well said, Pick up your mat and walk. And it's, it's really sad to me that the leaders skip right over the fact that he was made well. They go to the violation that's filling their eyes. They want to know who this man is. And the amusing thing is, he doesn't even know. He hadn't bothered to ask or get to know his healer. And Jesus, who wasn't really looking for conflict, had slipped away unnoticed. Now, these other people who are giving him a hard time might not feel the weight, the significance of what had happened to him that day. And that may happen to us if we're healed. 
Other people might not even know. They might give us a hard time. And we're not used to getting a hard time about stuff. What? Don't you know? That's not that important thing. But they can kind of confuse us and, and help us forget how important it is what God has just done in our life. But Jesus doesn't let the religious leader's criticism be the last word in the story. It's not the last word spoken into his life. He invites him to an even greater wholeness. He made a point of seeking this man out in the temple. And once he found him, they got to know each other better. Now he knows it's Jesus that healed him. And Jesus brings his attention back. You've been given a gift. You are well. You're physically well. But then he gives them a, a word of caution. It says, do not sin or something worse may happen to you. I think the big point here is that he wants the man to be spiritually healthy, not just physically healthy, because he could fall right into another trap that ties his life up and makes him in bondage. It doesn't mean that he had been doing something wrong, and that's why he hadn't been able to walk. Because later in the book of John, Jesus clearly refutes this idea that people's sin is responsible for them not being well. But I do see this as an invitation. Let's not just settle and focus on physical healing, when relationship with God can bring us to an even greater healing and wholeness. What's greater than just physical wholeness? Wholeness in every dimension of ourselves, in the physical, in the spiritual, in our emotional, our social, our relationships, our mental, the way we think. God wants us to be free and whole in all of these, to speak a word of life into our whole build, our whole being, because they're all interconnected, aren't they? Are we lifting our whole selves up to God or just one little part? Are you willing to put your whole self into God's healing hands? Do you want to be made well? Would you pray with me? Dear God, you know our human nature. Sometimes we like to stick with the comfort comfort of knowing what's our struggle instead of facing an unknown without it. Would you give us the courage, the stirring of your spirit, the vision, the dream to know what our life could be with your wholeness flowing through all of these dimensions of ourself. We pray that we would trust you with our lives. And Lord, I know that that will be a blessing to your heart, to us, and to everyone around us if we do. In Jesus' name, amen. The choir's going to sing um, a song called Remember Me before we turn our hearts to communion. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.